So thank you, uh, Fabrizio and, and Stefano, for inviting me to this nice conference, a very beautiful place. It was a pleasure to be in Pisa. So um, I'm going to uh, speak about uh, also financial instability, but from a risk management point of view. So the title is uh, when, when, when Diversification Increases Risk, Fire Sales, Contagion, and Endogenous Instabilities in Financial Markets. So I think that so all the speakers have alluded to this issue of systemic risk, and uh, so here, you know, uh, so in, in the recent years we've had uh, you know many discussions about uh, the scenarios or mechanisms which lead to systemic risk, and here I I have a partial list of uh, some some mechanisms that did did contribute to systemic risk in the recent and not so recent crises. So here we're concerned with scenarios where many uh, financial institutions simultaneously suffer large losses. And uh, the first mechanism that comes to mind is what people call correlations. I mean, uh, if uh, portfolios uh, have common exposures and there has a large loss in one asset class and everybody holds that asset class, well, this will lead to large simultaneous losses. And that's uh, something that is fairly well understood, and this is captured by factor mo models of core correlation uh, in asset prices. Then what we uh, have had a lot uh, in, the, in the recent literature is, is discussions on network models and how the, the counterparty networks that link various financial institutions can also lead to contagion, and some speakers al alluded to this earlier. So you can have contagion via insolvency or illiquidity because uh, the default of one institution can lead to the loss of the assets uh, of the assets held by its counterparties, which may then result in their insolvency, or it can generate the margin calls, short-term demands for liquidity, which, if they cannot be met by uh, these institutions, can lead to default. Uh, but as, uh, as Don Farmer uh, said this morning in his talk, there is a fourth mechanism which is even more perverse, and that's uh, um, what we could call price-mediated contagion or market-mediated contagion. And this is uh, due to feedback effects of, uh, of the actions of uh, market participants on price dynamics and, and, uh, and then price dynamics on the actions of market participants. So there's a feedback loop going on here. And this was a mechanism that was very important in the recent crisis and led to the spread of losses across uh, the financial sector and across countries. And this is the phenomena of fire sales. So, uh, in a, so a crisis may start with an exogenous shock to the financial sector, which is uh, due to some loss in some, um, some sector of the economy, some large fluctuations in some economic variables, so for example, subprime and so on. And then, uh, and since these institutions are, are subject to constraints, uh, liquidity constraints, capital constraints, this may result in them being required, or, or either they're required by regulation, or they decide to, because their investors ask them to, to sell or liquidate part of their portfolios uh, very quickly. In a short time, large quantities of assets may be sold over a short time. So this uh, to deleverage their portfolios or face capital requirements, and this can lead, uh, as we saw in Don't Start, this can lead to um, uh, the, the depreciation of asset prices, therefore generating losses in portfolios of, of people holding the same assets, and they in turn may, may deleverage and so on. So this can lead to uh, to feedback cycles or feedback loops, which. Uh, uh, can generate instabilities, and these instabilities, um, so in pr principle, they are linked to the first mechanism of correlation. If people you know, hold totally different assets, if they're totally segmented, uh, then these kinds of instabilities may not happen. But what I'm trying to, what I will try to argue in this talk is that these feedback effects may amplify greatly the, uh, the risks um, uh, that are purely due to correlation in no normal times. So, the fact that a large number of, uh, of, um, of institutions hold the similar assets can lead to instability feedback, uh, which will greatly amplify the risk of their portfolios with respect to what they uh, expect to have as, as risk in their portfolios. 
Okay? Now, so in my talk, I'm going to f focus on this fourth mechanism, uh, and I will try to hmm, hmm, present a quantitative modeling framework which can be, which is compatible with existing approaches in risk management. So it's not a totally different framework that has nothing to do with what people do in risk management today, and that can be uh, seen as an add-on to the current statistical approaches in risk management, and which tries to ca capture these feedback effects in a way that uh, can be used in practice for computing risk, com computing this, uh, uh, the impact of this of these instabilities on portfolio risk. Okay, and in particular, something that I will try to uh, show is that when you do take these mechanisms into account, uh, so in the recent debates on regulation, there has been a lot of talk about macro prudential regulation. So, so if you read, you know, you know any 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 of these um, any of these reports published by various regulatory agencies, they say, yeah, you know, we, we are thinking about macroprudential, stress density, macroprudential ways of, you know, dealing with uh, risk. So the, the idea is that they, they want to devise instruments for regulation which focus on systemic risk and so on. And at the same time, uh, regulators have not abandoned uh, their traditional approach, which is microprudential, which is focused on the institution level risk. And it seems a little bit, uh, sometimes it's, uh, as I will try to show, it, these two objectives can be incompatible. So I will show examples in which a rule which can make an individual bank safer uh, in, uh, um, at least on the surface, can uh, lead to an increase in systemic risk when applied to uh, all institutions as a regulatory you know, requirement. So it's not clear to me, I mean, it's, it's even clear to me that it's, that it's not, uh, always the case that you can simultaneously uh, follow a macro potential and a micro potential path simultaneously and be coherent. And this is something that hasn't been really discussed at length because um, you see a lot of discussion on macro potential regulation, but there is no question of abandoning the tra traditional micro potential uh, capital requirements and so on. So this seems to be a little bit uh, incoherent. Okay, so here I'm, I'm going to look at uh, start from you know a, a brief description of what risk management is, uh, how risk management is currently done in financial institutions. It's it, it, it's important to start with, with this discussion since you know we're not the issue. I think the what what uh, quantitative modeling should be uh, could possibly do in this field is not to start with you know a model where we start from scratch and then, then tell the regulators and risk managers, okay, here's a model which has nothing to do with your current way of thinking and you should throw everything away and use this. This is not, I mean, I don't think it's a very, uh, it will have a large impact if we do it this way. So uh, our approach has been to, you know, start from what exists in the industry and, and try to see how you, how you can uh, incrementally improve that to take into account some of these effects. So if you look at how, how the managers in the industry, in the banking industry and the fund management industry deal with risk, well, it's typically done with a statistical approach, okay? So this is not the only approach that you could use conceptually, but this is what is done by everybody. So what is the statistical approach to risk management? Well, uh, almost all institutions I've seen, uh, they use uh, at some point a statistical factor model for the variations in the mark-to-market values of their portfolios, okay? So that's, I think, there is no controversy in this. So the keywords here are in, in bold. There's statistical and mark-to-market, okay? So statistical, it means that you look at the risk factors affecting your portfolios, you enumerate them, you identify them, and then you model them as exogenous stochastic processes so the models can be very simple or very complicated. They can range from static Gaussian factor models to, to dynamic continuous time mo models involving uh, jumps, stochastic volatility, heavy tail distributions, heteroscedasticity, etc. And you have a whole industry, you know, uh, but devoted to but, but developing such models. And the aim uh, in the in in the last um, in the last few decades, the aim of this, you know line of 
research has been to develop a more realistic statistical description of volatility risk, correlation risk, tail risk, and so on. So, uh, and these tools are pretty standard. I mean, they exist in the form of, of software, off-the-shelf software that, that you can buy and use in your risk management systems. And, and typically, uh, the way they are used is that uh, you take some statistical model and then you estimate it from recent historical data. And then you use that, that model for computing the loss distributions and simulating the risk scenarios. So, so obviously, as I said, there's a wide variety of such models. I'm not going to uh, um, go into the details here, but all of these models, whether they're static Gaussian factor models or very complicated dynamic models, they have some key common features. And here are the common features. First of all, uh, the vast majority of models used in risk management uh, focus on uh, risk factors which are the returns or variations of some benchmark indicators, so typically indices or, um, or things like indices. And uh, so we focus on the returns in, in, in these models. So what is special about this uh, is that if you look at the returns, so you don't take into account size, okay? So you're not looking at the sizes of uh, any strategy or portfolio. So you look at the percentage change in these, and th those are typically used as the factors in most models. So the, um, the other assumption that is implicit in the way the models are used, they can, I mean, in Principle, uh, you could uh, remove this, but in practice, almost all the models used in risk management are estimated using historical data, and in fact, recent historical data. Um, they, uh, they have an em embedded stationarity assumption. So if you use historical data to estimate your parameters, then you use the same parameters to mm, generate the future scenarios. It means that you, you're assuming that the past statistical properties reflect the future statistical properties. Otherwise, there's no point in, in, in doing that. So that may be fine, but there's something that you will always miss in such an approach, that's event risk, okay? So uh, statistical you know, stationarity means that the type of risk you, you're going to capture, even if your model is very sophisticated, you're going to capture uh, events with uh, small or large tail events or center events, that's not the point that uh, repeat in your data set, that are sufficiently, uh, um, that are repeated sufficiently frequently for your estimation procedure to capture that. If it's something that never ever happened in your data set, there is no chance that your estimation will you know, cap capture that kind of effect. So they miss event risk. <coughs> also, uh, a third thing that I will not discuss, yeah, so the third thing is that once you have these models, Okay, so that's not always the case, but in most instances that I've seen, in banks at least, it's the case. Once you have these statistical models, uh, they are, are typically applied to portfolios. So this is, for example, the standard approach when computing the value at risk for bank portfolios. You look at the portfolio as a static object, so you look at the allocation of the bank at date t. Then you choose your favorite risk measure, value at risk expected shortfall, and then you compute this risk measure for the portfolio. So here I'm opposing portfolio to strategy, which is you know, how the portfolio is deployed in time. And, and um, uh, so it means that you treat the portfolio as a buy and hold over the horizon of the risk calculation, whereas you know, most financial institutions but do not engage in a buy and hold strategy. For example, they're hedging something with something else. So if the value of their uh, of, 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 of the primary instrument changes in some way, the hedge uh, will also adjust. So it's not a static position. But this is not reflected in the way uh, risk is computed for these things. And fourth, it's something also that Don Farmer discussed in his talk, is that uh, the models are uh, estimated from and applied to mark-to-market values of instruments. Okay, so it's a model for statistical variations of market value of some portfolio. 
And if you think about it, you know, when we think about extreme situations of risk, when there's a crisis or something like that, what people are really concerned with is liquidation value. So if you have a problem and you have to exit your positions, well, how much can you get for those positions? That's not about market value. That's about liquidation value. So in, implicitly, when you compute the risk based on market value, you assume that the, the difference is ne negligible. But as we'll see, it's in the instances where these models failed, the difference was not negligible. So as in don't start, I'm going to plead for a focus on liquidation value as opposed to market value. And, and of course, it's easy to plead for that in, in, at an abstract level. But what we need is a framework where you, can, where you can actually compute that difference and say some, something about it at a practical level. OK, so the point here is that on the last point, the point I will try to make is that in scenarios where real risk occurs, where there is really bad things that are happening to your portfolio, that these two quantities, mark to market and liquidation value, can happen to diverge in, in a very strong way. OK. Now, what we've also seen is that these uh, standard risk management models have repeatedly failed to anticipate the risk of portfolios during crisis situations. Okay, so, uh, so here are some examples that were also hmm, referred to in the talk by hmm, Pete Carl yesterday, Black Monday, stock market crash of 87, the LTCM event of, of 98, the subprime crisis, the quant crash of August 2007. I will, I will go into these examples a little bit more in detail in the following slides, but so all these events, are events where large institutions with, with seemingly sophisticated uh, risk management systems failed to anticipate or evaluate correctly the risk of their portfolios, and they were surprised to see that the risk embedded in the portfolios was much bigger than they anticipated. And the way that these uh, statistical, uh, statistical frameworks view these events is that the if you look at these events through the, uh, through the, um, the uh, angle of these statistical models, what you see is they're characterized by unexpected shifts or spikes or jumps in the parameters that are input in the model. So, so the volatilities and correlations that are used to compute risk in these models, in all these cases, they jump up or, or they spike uh, <laughs> during these, these events. And the result is that when you have sudden shifts in volatility and correlations, well, risk factors were, which were assumed to be uncorrelated, they all of a sudden will become strongly correlated, or things that were, there were supposed to be independent, they, they will <laughs> suddenly shift in the same direction. So here are some examples that I will elaborate on later. So here is uh, the graph as a function of time of the average by pairwise by correlation in two uh, indices. So the red curve is the average <laughs> pairwise correlation across stock returns in the Eurostock 50 index. The blue curve is the average <laughs> pairwise by correlation of the returns across sector indices in the S&P 500, the so-called SPDRs. And what you see in both cases is that you know, both of these indicators of correlation, they tell you on the rough indicators of the level of correlations you, you see across the, the returns or the s <laughs> sectors in these European and American indices. And they're pretty constant in, two, in, in 2008. So all this is for one year, 2008. In 2008, they're pretty constant from uh, the beginning of the year up to September 15. And all of a sudden, they start increasing and they shoot upwards until the end of the year. So they go, for example, for the case of, um, of the Euro stocks, they are, are equal to 50% you know, for all the year up to September. Then all of a sudden, they shoot upwards, and they end up at 65% uh, at in November. And if you continue the curve, they end up at 80% end of December. OK, so, uh, so in this case, if you look at a, a statistical framework where you use these correlations as inputs, Okay, so up to the moment when the, when, uh, so of course, th the date at which this, uh, this thing started to go up is the collapse of, of the Lehman Brothers. So you have a portfolio in which you have some risk. You look at the risk in terms of the correlation volatility. So you, you use this historical input for your correlation, and it seems, you know, to be stable at 50%. And so you compute the risk of your portfolio 
And then in the, in the scenario where the risk actually hits your portfolio, where there is a large law loss and prices start to m move in a bad way after the collapse of Lehman, well, it, it turns out that the correlation used what was the wrong one since the realized correlation is, like, uh, is uh, actually um, substantially higher. And <laughs> other examples, so on, on this graph I have a picture, yeah. It fell down. It fell down. It fell down. I will. I, I will come back to this. Why this happened and so on. But yeah. So the, there was a plateau and it fell down uh, early 2009. So here is another graph showing the same thing on other data with other estimation methods. So on the on the previous graph, I just showed you an exponentially weighting by moving average, but, but you can estimate correlation with other indicators more, more, more sophisticated. So on this graph, I show you a picture that was taken from a paper by Rob Engel. So he uses a, a more a sophisticated approach to estimate correlation. So it's, a, it's the DCC Garch approach, okay? So here, uh, he has done that for uh, the same type of data, but other indices. So here, for example, if you look at the black line here, this is the 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 dynamic uh, um, the the dynamic indicator of correlation for the energy sector in the U.S. Uh, uh, the e SPDR for energy sector and the and the technology sector. So what you see, for example, is that in between uh, in between but July but 2008 and end of the year 2008, this correlation indicator ranges from minus 20 percent to uh, 85 percent. So it's really a, a huge range of variation. So it's not a really a small correction. It's not like 10% variation. You go from minus 20% to 85%. And the sign change changes. So you could claim that initially the sign was spurious, but even if they claim that initially it was zero, well, you go from zero to 80%. It's a big deal. So well, just to make sure I understand, you take the stocks that are in the energy sector and you compute pairwise correlations between them? No, no, no. So here, the uh, <laughs> SPDRs are, are sector in indices, if you like, their portfolios of energy stocks and the portfolio of technology stocks, and you take the correlation between the two on a moving the window, if you like. So it, it tells you what is the correlation between the two along in the last three months. And the thing is, this changes sign, it goes from something very small to some, something close to one. So there's this clear shift in these correlations in a very strong way. So. If you have a model in which you focus on, you know, the dynamics of individual stocks, you put stochastic volatility, jumps, you know, this and that, but then you assume that the correlations are constant, which is typically what 99% of the models do, well, you know, this graph shows there's some, something wrong. Maybe you put the sophistication in the wrong place, and this will cost you dearly because correlation is the big, you know, very important variable which, which, which will but determine allocation of your portfolio. So it's very important, it's not a, a detail. Okay, so now, other, so in these examples, it's, uh, well, a posteriori, you could take these samples and say, okay, I'm, I'm going to, there's a re regime shift, I'm going to uh, do some statistics and find the, uh, uh, the point at which the regime shift occurs, there's a break point, blah, 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 but it's, that's in sample. And you know, it doesn't really help to do it in real life because in real life, what you want is something that tells you before the whole thing exposed that there is some risk in your portfolio. So that's not really going to help you here. And there are other examples that, uh, that were mentioned in the talk by, by <laughs> Pete Kyle yesterday and uh, the, where you see things that happen in the market, some type of <laughs> market behavior which if you look at it you know, from a, um, an observer's perspective, they, they looked at totally unexpected events. So here's an event I will speak about in my example later. On the left, what you see is a graph of what's called the quant crash of August 2007. So it's a study that was, that was um, published in 2009 by Andrew Lowe and, and Amir Kandani. So they documented in this nice paper an event that happened in the hedge fund, uh, in the hedge fund sector in August 2007. So what you see on this graph is for each week from July to end of August 2007, what you see is the bar chart indicating the returns um, uh, over, over 
over a very spare time scale of, um, of a long short, of, of a typical uh, long short market but neutral equity fund. And what you see is that over each week, so here is one week, so for example, here is one week, here is the next week, and so on. So the returns are, are computed over five minutes, 10, 10 minutes, 60 minutes, and so on. So, so what you see is that over all these weeks, uh, so, all, uh, so a fund like this, so a long short market neutral equity fund is a fund that is invested in equity, in stocks, and it has long and short positions, and the market Neutrality means that its, its, its returns are uncorrelated or have a low correlation with the index. So it's, it's been neutral to the market index. That's the idea. And there is an industry in the hedge fund industry, there are a lot of funds that have this feature. And they are, their ar argument is, is to say that investors you know, who, who hold index funds, they can invest in these things and they're uncorrelated so that but diversifies their. And what ha happened is that in this sector, uh, in the, in the week uh, of, uh, that ran from August 7 to August, um, it's hard to read here, August uh, 11, but 2007, all of a sudden, all the funds in this sector uh, had large but negative returns of the order of, of, of the minus 15 to 20% per day for three consecutive days. And this happened all across the board. So it's not just one fund. A lot of these funds had these large negative returns. And then after the end of that week, it went back to normal. So you see that, these, that the following weeks were exactly the same as, be, as before, even slightly, slightly improved with respect to the historical record. But so something ha happened here. And it's really hard to argue that if you use this kind of data, uh, you can say anything statistical about you know this week. It's it's hard to say that this thing will be predicted by the past time series. Okay. So all these examples are things where if even if you have a statistical model which is you know sophisticated and you know it, and and estimated from the recent data, it's uh, it's not very likely that it can tell you something useful about. <laughs> the big event that created the loss in your portfolio. So in this case, this, this, uh, by the quant crash and the, in the other examples I gave you, the spikes in core correlations and so on. Okay, so uh, what is a common but defining feature of these events? Well, of course, they're associated with large moves, large shifts in prices, volatility, and correlations. But there are large unexpected moves. So in a, in a statistical model that is calibrated or estimated for, to recent data, you don't see these moves as, uh, as, as an event that has a substantial probability. They're either impossible under those models or they're outliers or things like that. OK. Now, so a lot of these observations have been used as an argument for uh, saying that, you know, OK, uh, these are black swans. So, uh, and this proves that you know all this statistical approach, but to risk is crap be because uh, it works uh, when things are nice. But as soon as there is a big shift in the market variables, there's something interesting going on in the market risk-wise. They don't work. Okay. So I heard a, a colleague of mine in France, you know, uh, uh, gave an interview on the on on on. on television and they asked this colleague, you know, why did the models fail to work during the crisis? And, and the answer that the colleague gave was, well, you know, these are like, uh, um, these, uh, these models have been used out of context. They were, they were like the cars that, had a, uh, that were supposed to be, you know, used at the speed limit of 100 and they were used at a speed of 300. But that's, that's really uh, not a good argument because it's like we're saying that I have, uh, I have an umbrella that, does, that works unless it rains. You know, it's, it's not supposed to work when it rains, but that's not a very good model. That's not a very good thing to use. So, <clears throat> and that's a, exactly the argument of the black swan thing. They say that, well, these, these events, look, just look at these uh, examples. They're totally unpredictable outliers. There's no way that, that you can get the risk of these events in your model with a statistical approach. 
So uh, uh, this, this statistical approach fails when it's uh, supposed to work. And it's a strong argument. And I think that this argument cannot be totally ignored. One must answer but to this argument. Otherwise, it's not credible. And so here I, I claim on this slide that so I, it's an American slide for those who know. So there's this film by Al Gore on, uh, on global warming. It was called The Inconvenient Truth. So here I claim that the black swan is the opposite. It's a convenient untruth. Okay? It's convenient because it removes the blame from, for, uh, from all the people who are, who are, who are um, developing and running these mob models because they say, oh, you know, it was a perfect storm or you know, black swan. It's impossible to do anything about it. So it's not my fault. I, di I, I, I did the modeling correctly. I, I applied it according to the statistical state of the art statistical rules. But didn't work, it's just something that is unpredictable, okay. But here, what I will try to argue is that uh, this is not my point of view, and I think that that was also the, uh, what, uh, what we saw in the, in the talk of, of Pete Kyle. What I would tr try to argue is that these events, um, these events ha have actually a large, large component of predictability, and the reason that the statistical models have failed to predict or explain or understand this risk is not that they're not sophisticated statistically, is, not, is, is that they're not sophisticated from an economic point of view. So they fail to integrate simple mechanisms that we've seen in the previous talks, which is feedback f f uh, and instabilities that are easy to understand at a conceptual level, and I'll try to argue that they're also easy to include in the models. And if you include them, even with a very basic statistical framework, you can un understand a lot about these outliers, and these outliers will not be outliers anymore. There will be you know, scenarios that are quite plausible under the model. OK, so uh, let's go. So, so I will I claim that all of these examples I gave I linked to the same, same fundamental mechanism. And this mechanism is the idea of fire sales or liquidation in a, in a crisis scenario. OK, so what is fire sales? So I, I think that the, that the previous talks have, have alluded to this. But what I mean by fire sales is that a scenario in, in which a financial institution or, mar or market participant is led to liquidate quickly a large chunk of its portfolio in a short time. And this happened a lot in the recent crisis, as you know, since uh, what happened after the Lehman default is that uh, th there was initial market turbulence, but simultaneously the, the, uh, the defaulted Lehman portfolio had to be liquidated, so that, that led to a large liquidation of assets uh, that was in Lehman's portfolio over a short time period. This led to a depreciation as in asset par prices, high market volatility. And what happened is that across the board, all the banks holding these assets, they saw their risk indicators go up. Okay? So even if you were holding a static portfolio, just because you were ho holding things which were also hold, held by these banks which were liquidating, your risk indicators went up. So it means that without changing anything in your assets and liability structure, you had all of a sudden more risk, so you needed more capital. So the, if you have more risk in your portfolio and you need more capital because of the capital requirements indexed on this uh, backward-looking computation of risk, because you com com compute the risk based on recent data, it means that you have to... Yeah, but it's, it's yeah. So it's backward looking and it's based on recent data. So it means that if there's a recent event in the market which you know, causes a large uh, volatility, even if your portfolio has not changed, you recompute your risk the next day, your risk has increased. Okay, because you incorporate new data with big returns, uh, big negative returns. Okay, so now it means that all of a sudden you have to either raise your capital or you have to decrease the sizes of, uh, of your positions so that the ratio of capital to the size is constant or <laughs> above a certain level. So typically, in the crisis situation, it was very difficult for banks to raise capital all of a sudden from outside. So what everybody did was they tried to sell off part of their position to deleverage their portfolio. And uh, this led to the, the 
the deleveraging de or, or, or the s sales of assets across bank portfolios all across the board. Okay? So even though this bank may not have had a lot jargon, and an initial uh, loss in some portfolio, large portfolio, led uh, uh, to um, an instability because uh, these requirements were applied to all portfolios, and therefore they, they forced a lot of, a lot of banks to be simultaneously be deleverage their positions. So, uh, okay, so here is an, uh, an example that's an important example where uh, Higher sales occurred on a large scale in the banking sector, but, but the higher sales can, can also occur in, in other institutions which, are not, uh, you know, which, which may not be subject to external regulatory requirements. Uh, this, can be, this can happen because uh, the fund or the, or the institution or, or, the, or the portfolio has to face the liquidity um, a liquidity constraint, so they have to raise liquidity or cash in a crisis per situation when they face margin calls and so on. Or it can occur uh, if the investors in the funds attempt to exit their, their, their positions after a large loss. So this can happen in pension funds or in the mutual funds. So when the fund has a large loss, investors say, oh, I'm not happy with this fund. They just lost the 15%, so I want my money back. Okay, and uh, usually this hap happens simultaneously across the investors in the fund because they don't just uh, hmm, 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 redeem their positions at random. They would redeem their positions once they see a bad event in the in the portfolio. Okay, so all these all these events, so all these all these factors which lead to fire sales or or fast liquidation of positions, they do not happen at random. They happen when there is a sudden loss in asset value. And that's the thing that, I'm, that I will try to model. Once there's a loss in asset value in, in the portfolio, there are some of these mechanisms, or all of these simultaneously, which lead to fire sale, which lead the portfolio to liquidate some of its positions in a, uh, in a short time. And what we want to see is that if this happens, what ha happens to the portfolio? And what happens to these risk indicators? And what we'll see is that this can explain in a very simple way why these correlations and volatilities were going up and then they were stabilizing over a plateau and then, then, then coming down again. I will try to show that these spikes and then plateaus and coming down are exactly linked to the period during which this liquidation happens and I will link uh, these va the values of these plateaus and the length of these, of these plateaus uh, in an analytical way to the, the, the parameters describing the liquidation. Okay. So how does that work? So let's look at the stylized model for, uh, for fire sales, in which I look at a leveraged fund. It's a fund which holds alpha I uh, in asset class I. So alpha I is, a num is the number of the shares, if you like. And the value of the fund, I will denote it V. So SI is the value of the index or asset class uh, I. So uh, at this level, one can think of the SIs either as individual assets, so if you think about an equity example, as I'll do in, at the end, or you can think about the SIs as indices, so I have an allocation in, you know, across asset classes, and then SIs just can be index, it can be an index, uh, a US stock index, a Japanese stock index, so And so the, uh, so in all these a mechanism that lead to fire sales, the mechanism is asymmetric in the sense that as long as the fund is performing well, there is no fire sales, but, but nothing happens. And um, uh, the fire sales kick in when the fund loses in value a substantial amount of its initial value. Okay? So what ha happens is that uh, if the fund uh, undergoes a large loss, then investors or the fund 
manager will start exiting some of its positions, so we start liquidating part of the positions. And this can happen uh, um, for, for various reasons. It, it can happen but due to capital requirements, due to liquidity constraints, or due to just investors exiting their position. So I will not, in the model, I will not make behavioral assumptions on investors or fund managers. Uh, it can be any of these mechanisms. They ultimately lead to the same effect, is that when the value falls, when there are losses in asset value, it triggers sales, and I want to model how this initial shock will lead to more you know, shocks or more, more instability. So I call this run for the exit. And that's a good, uh, good way, way to you know, think about this. So as I said, it's not a model where I have agents doing a very complicated things. So we will capture. So the only thing I'm interested in is the aggregate, aggregate effect on of these fire sales on on the on the on the on, on the aggregate of supply and demand for these assets, and this can be and this can be injected in the model with one uh, ingredient, and that's what I call a deleveraging schedule. So the only thing you have to know, really, at the aggregate level, is when the fund value drops, how fast do we or do they exit their positions? That's all. And I don't need to know how fast you exit and how he exits. I, I, I only need, need to know the aggregate effect. So the speed at which you exit the position. So this speed can be uh, represented or parameterized by a function. And this function, which I call f in the, in the notations later, just tells me uh, if the, if the fund, fund value drops from here to here, what is the, what is the portion of the, of the, of the uh, positions that I liquidate, okay? And the only thing I'm going to, to assume, really, is that it's an increasing function. So the more the fund value drops, the more you sell. It's not a wild assumption. And at some point, uh, it will be convenient to, to assume that it's also concave. So what does concave mean? It means that if the, if the fund value drops faster, I sell faster. Okay, so if I drop, the fund value drops by 5%, I sell some proportion. If it drops now from 5 to 15%, I say, oh, oh, this is really bad, then I sell more. That's not a very important assumption, but it will lead to some nice properties in the form formulas. So the only thing I assume there is a function out there and it looks like, like this. So the only thing I need to know is that this function is in, increasing, and, and above some threshold, it's constant, because if, if the value is, is larger than my initial value, so if I actually gain bad value in the portfolio, there's, n there's no, no motivation to induce in fire cells. So, um, and uh, that's it. Yeah, that's it. So the only thing is, it's an increasing function that after a threshold is constant. Okay, so if the fund is increasing value, I just buy and hold. Okay, okay now uh, having in introduced this fun function f, what, I, what, what it means is that if the value of the fund goes from vk to vk plus one under the effect of exogenous you know, fundamental fac factors, for instance, then the quantity that I will liquidate is this, is f of vk plus one minus f of vk. So here I normalize it by initial value, but that's a detail. And now what we need to introduce is the price impact, as in don't stock. So what we need to say is, well, okay, here's a guy who, is, who, who will induce a systematic supply and demand uh, in, the, in the market, which cannot be modeled as a noise term, because the noise term is a term that is independent from period to period, it's uncorrelated with the previous returns. But this guy has a demand and supply uh, um, impact which is not independent from the previous returns. It will only be non-zero if the previous return is negative and large in value. So it's not independent at all. So I cannot, I cannot simply absorb this term into the, the noise term and argue that it's just uh, some other noise term. So it's a systematic term that is non-random. Non so this, this demand will have a non-random impact on the price, and the impact can be, can be modeled in various ways, a linear or non-linear. In this talk, I will look at the linear impact, but in the paper, you can find also the same computations for, 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 
a nonlinear impact function. Okay, so I assume that the impact of this liquidation on the price is proportional to the liquidated quantity, and the proportionality of the constant is a constant that I call lambda i, and it's, it's the market by depth of the asset i. So it's the net excess per demand that will move the price of security i by, 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 by one unit. Okay, so it, it's the excess per demand that you need to move, move the price of asset i by, by one unit. Okay, so now, if we, if we look at the whole thing but, but together, what I uh, have here is a, is a, is a multi-period multi model where, uh, well, <laughs> the returns in asset class I have two contributions. Well, the first is a noise term. So here, these are, I have some variables here, Xi IK. So Xi IK is the impact of fundamentals, if you like, on the return of asset I at period K, and here I assume that, that, that these are IID variables with some arbitrary distribution, and they have a covariance structure that can be called the fundamental covariance structure. So if there was no <laughs> fire sales in the portfolio, then what I will have will be a dependent structure with a constant covariance, and that's the covariance of these guys. And then, if there are fire sales, then I have an extra term that is the price impact of these fire sales, and that's the term I just described here. So each period, the value of the portfolio will move from, from VK to this value here, which is the initial value plus the, 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 the contribution of the fundamental you know, noise terms. And, and if this is, uh, is large and negative, then this can induce fire sales, and this is the magnitude of fire sales, and this is the price impact of those fire sales. Okay. Now, yeah, so here, if you look at, at this model, where from a technical point of view, it's just a Markov chain, okay? So, so because the, the evolution of the asset prices SI, uh, it, they depend on uh, the SIs themselves at the previous period, plus the value of the portfolio at the previous period. So it's just a Barkov chain that is easy to, to simulate if you want to. And here I will show you an example where I, I simulate this and we'll look at how, how volatility and correlation will, will behave once you incorporate this new term that captures price impact of, li of liquidations. So in this example I, I'll show you now, let's uh, lo look at a fund holding three asset classes and I will consider the case where these asset classes are independent in the sense that they're driven by independent risk factors. So initially, so it means the Xi I Ks I showed you are really independent across I and K, and so it means the fundamental the covariances or correlations are zero. And now I'll look at a scenario where the fund quickly reduces its position by 20% over one month, and where it generates a volume which is 10% of market debt during the period, okay? It's the numbers that we he heard in the talks of Pete Kalt yesterday, so 10%. So it means that it liquidates it, its, its positions over one month, and during that one month, it's going to trade roughly at 10% of average daily volume. So it's a large fund. So the quest question is, if you do this, then it means that if you look at, it, at this term, alpha i over lambda i uh, multiplied by this change in f, this term has roughly a uh, magnitude of 10% uh, during that period. Okay, now, so what we do is we, we look at this model, so we do the simulations of, of this part of chain, and I'm going to now take the scenarios by simulated from this part of chain, and then I say, okay, now if I'm a market observer, I just look at these price prices, and I just estimate my volatilities and correlations as if this were the market price. What do I see? Well, here's what you see. If you look at, so this is the histogram showing the distribution of the realized correlations of these asset classes across the simulated scenario. So if you have no uh, liquidation, then okay, the true correlation is zero, so you're estimating zero, so you should find something centered around zero plus some, st some statistical error. And that's what, what you find indeed in the, uh, in the case, case where you don't have feedback, your, your estimator has a distribution which is centered around zero, and this is the statistical error. Now, if you put this 
extra term, what you see is now this blue histogram, which as you can see is substantially skewed towards the right, meaning that there are many scenarios in which you have substantial positive and significant correlation can be going up to 60%. So you can get 60% of correlation across strategies which are initially, which are independent, they have independent <laughs> risk factors in them. How is that? And now, so this is across all scenarios. Now if you look only at those scenarios where the portfolio has a loss, so this is like by looking at conditional but correlation of two strategies uh, in the scenario where the global portfolio has a loss, then it's even worse. Then it looks like this. It's centered around 30%, and, and the distribution is, is, is looking like this. So this is the histogram only for the scenarios where the portfolio has a loss. So what you see is that the conditional correlation of these, uh, in principle, independent strategies, independent portfolios, when the global portfolio has a loss is actually quite significant and systematically greater than zero, and it's even not very small, it's, it's, it's the 30%. And this is the case where the true correlation is zero. And now if you look at the, in each scenario you compute the realized core correlation and you compare it with the base case where there is, where there is um, uh, no liquidity effect. So here in this case, I don't look at only the base case where the strategies have a zero correlation. I can change this correlation and I can see you know, how the realized correlation compares to the fundamental correlation that I put in my simulation. So that's something that you can do with, with, with the simulation that we real data. What you see is that these are always above or either equal or above uh, the, the, the theoretical or fundamental correlations and the points uh, which fall on the straight line the, uh, are the scenarios where there is no loss and it, every time there is a loss which is large enough to trigger fire sales you have an excess correlation. And of course if you have excess correlation this leads to excess volatility so here's the same graph in terms of fund volatility so if you underestimate correlation you underestimate your fund volatility so the, the volatility that you would get from uh, historical correlations and uh, is systematically underestimating the volatility you will get in these scenarios and this is the, the difference. So the difference is not small, it can go up to like 100% of, uh, of, the, of the relative value. So now uh, the question is, is this specific to this example or is it a general phenomenon? How general is it and what can you say about this? Can you only assimilate or can you actually compute these differences? And the answer is yes, you can compute these and it's systematic, it's not just related to the scenario. So to do some analytics, what we do is we look at the diffusion limit of this model. So in the, in the, in the discrete thing I, I presented, it's a Markov chain, it's nice, but it's really hard to, com to compute with. It's a Mar Markov chain with a very complicated transition matrix. But what's easier to analyze is if you look at the continuous, of, uh, and continuous time limit of this Markov chain, then what you can show is that under mild assumptions on the, on the deleveraging schedule F and on, on the noise terms Xi, so you only need to assume that the, the, the deleveraging schedule, this increasing function, is a smooth function with three derivatives. So three is a technical thing. I don't think you really need three, but anyway. If you think that, if you assume it's a smooth function, so you smoothly but deleverage and not, you know, in, in uh, in jumps or in, you know, in staccato deleveraging. So you, and if you assume that the noise terms have fourth moment, so you don't need to assume that they're normally distributed or anything very specific, then what you can show is that in the, under the assumption that the deleveraging is done through frequent uh, 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 small trades and not in big blocks, that's, that's the main assumption that we're making here, then the dynamics that I showed you in the back of chain, the, the discrete dynamics converges to a diffusion model that is, is described by the stochastic differential equation. And the only thing special about it is that now, if you didn't have this deleveraging term, you had you know, a stationary Markov chain with some noise, under the assumptions that are here, that would converge to a Black-Scholes model with the same covariance matrix. So now you don't have a Black-Scholes model, but what you have is a, is a diffusion with state-dependent uh, drift and volatility. So it's not very complicated. That's the, something that we know how to deal with. And the state by dependence involves the deleveraging. Okay, so the fact that you're deleveraging, you, that 
that you're liquidating large quantities will change the volatility and change the drift. And this equation tells you by how much. So A is the square root of the initial volatility in matrix. So A is the volatility in the model without liquidation. And what, it, what this equation says is that really the change is pretty simple. The new volatility matrix will, will be the fundamental one plus a new term. And the term is proportional to something which is quite simple. Alpha i is the initial position in asset i. F prime is the derivative. It's the speed at which you're deleveraging. So alpha i times F prime is the volume you're liquidating per unit time. So it's very close to what you were um, uh, uh, discussing. And here, since I use a linear impact, so what you have is the volume liquidated but divided by the market impact. Uh, by the market depth. So if we use a nonlinear model, then the same nonlinear form will pop up here. It's, it's not really, you know, if you have a square root, you have a square root here in, in the volatility. And then this is multiplied by the volatility matrix, uh, multiplied by the vector of the portfolio. So this is just the volatility of the portfolio. Uh, J here means uh, in, com in component J. So it's volatility times the ratio of your volume to the, bar, bar, to the market depth, okay? So there is two-term volatility and then the fraction of market volume that you're consuming, if you like, okay? And, and now what we're interested in is, well, how does this contribute to correlation and, and, and covariance and, and risk? Well, you take this price dynamics now, which is uh, endogenous because it's con uh, there's a con contribution from your liquidation and, and fire sales, and now we can use it to compute the realized covariance. So what's the realized covariance now in, these, in this liquidation scenario? If you're the investor or some observer, what, uh, what by covariance do you see along the path? Well, you see this. This is the initial covariance matrix, the fundamental covariance, which you would have in absence of fire sales, and these red terms are due to fire sales. So it says that fire sales change actually the risk profile. So in Don't Stock, he insisted on the fact that fire sales depreciate the price. And most of the literature on fire sales has focused on price effects. Fire sales push down the price by how much they, they push down the price. So here we're looking also at the volatility dimension, the, the, the covariance per dimension. How do fire sales across a portfolio, because there are simultaneous fire sales across the positions, how do they distort the the covariance structure, the dependence structure, where they distort it in this, in this precise way. And again, these terms are all, all have the same form. Alpha J times F prime, the volume which I'm liquidating in asset class J, but divided by the depth, so it's a fraction of volume I'm consuming, times the volatility in, uh, uh, in the ith dimension. Okay, so what, what you see is that there's a first order term, so these are first order in, in bar, bar, market depth, and then there's a second order term that is typically very small. So what you see is that even starting from constant covariance parameters, what you get is something that is path dependent. Okay, when you do liquidation, when there are fire sales, the covariance will be path dependent, so the risk of the portfolio will be path dependent, even starting from constant assumptions on the fundamental covariance. And how big is this effect? So what you see is that the defining parameter is alpha over lambda, the, the size you're liquidating relative to market depth. Okay, how big are you, uh, your position relative to market depth? If uh, for things like, uh, if you take a ratio of one over 10, so 10%, which is the, the example I used earlier, this, this bias can be large. So this is the green curve here. Uh, so that's a, the, the defining quantity. If you're the, the, the position you're liquidating is 0.1% 1, of market depth. Okay, this is not very big, but as soon as you're a sizable fraction of market depth, and I'm not talking about market cap, I'm talking about bar market depth, which is a different issue, uh, that's, the, that's the relevant parameter. So it says that liquidation value is very different from market value and, and volatility needs to be adjusted as soon as this ra ratio is significant. So this is a very good rule of thumb, which I think can make sense for portfolio managers. And this quantity will be strictly positive even if the fundamental covariance is zero. So this is very easy to show, but I may skip this. Now, let's, so this was self-impact. So if I liquidate large position, I, I impact my own funds volatility and, and, and the correlations in my own portfolio. But what about cross-impact? 
Well, if you're another fund holding the same types of assets, well, if the realized but, co but covariance and correlations increase or decrease, this will affect also your fund. So how, how does this work? So, he, so he, on this slide, what I show is the spillover effect. So spillover effect says, if some large fund with allocation alpha liquidates its position through fire sales, I'm a small fund with positions mu, how, how am I affected? Well, the, uh, the realized um, volatility or the realized <laughs> a variance in my fund will be also of the same type. The black term is the realized variance in absence of these effects. So this is what I expect if I use the covariance computed from historical returns and if it's constant and stationary. And the red terms are the unexpected terms. These red, red terms will occur if somebody else is liquidating a large uh, a position and I hold the same assets, but not the same allocation, but just the same assets. So what you see here is that the, the, the important parameter in the spillover effect is some scalar product here. So P, pi mu is my portfolio, and lambda is the uh, positions of the other guy's portfolio, which is doing fire sales, scaled by market depth. Okay, so again, if the positions, the, the guy's liquidity are small in, in terms of market depth, this, this vector will be zero, so you forget. And it's order one in this, in this thing. So what that shows is that the, really the, the contagion effect is due to portfolio overlap. Okay, so this, this parameter, which, which is in all these terms, can be seen as a scalar product of the two portfolio weights, mu i and alpha i, with weights that are proportional to the inverse of market depth. So the overlap is all the more important if the asset class is illiquid. So if we overlap in a very liquid asset class, it's not, it's not so bad. But if we overlap in an illiquid asset class, that's going to hurt me a lot. So that's an important thing to know. If all the asset classes are equally liquid, then this is just the overlap in portfolio weights as usual. And it also says that if the two portfolios are orthogonal in the sense of this overlap with these weights, then you can have a massive fire sale in the first portfolio. It will not affect the second portfolio at all. It's invisible. And that's the scenario which happened in the August 2007 event. So somebody was liquidating, um, let me skip to this uh, example here, somebody that, ha ha that was a large bank exiting uh, you know, a large you know, position in, 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 in these long short <laughs> market neutral funds was liquidating this, this position and other market neutral funds which had an overlap with this fund had uh, experienced this spillover effect. But simultaneously, what was really interesting is that during that week in August 2007, the stock indices, Dow Jones, S&P, barely moved. They didn't have any significant move. And that was really what surprised people. They said, why do these funds lose 20% while the index doesn't move? They're equity funds. What, what's going on? And I mean, in this perspective, it's very clear. It's because the fund being liquidated was a market neutral fund. So by construction, it was orthogonal to the indices. So you could liquidate a huge position in that fund, the indice wasn't affected, but the other funds running similar strategies would have an overlap and be strongly affected. So here, what we're really talking about this is that this phenomenon leads to contagion when there is strategy crowding. If I'm the only guy doing my strategy and I, I, I have a massive fire sale, nobody cares. If uh, I'm in a group of strategies you know, are, that are very, uh, very similar, uh, then that's going, going to be a major risk factor. Okay, so let me, uh, I think I'm over time here, so let me uh, conclude with some observations. Well, these results show that this, this phenomenon of fire sales or distressed by selling can exacerbate fund volatility and lead to spikes in correlations, which are very similar to what we saw in the examples I started in the beginning. And this can occur without liquidity drying up. So in the, in the analysis, lambda, the market depths are assumed constant. So it doesn't have, have to be due to liquidity drying up. It's just a large uh, sale that initiates the whole thing, exactly like in the scenarios that were described in Pete Kyle's talk. Uh, and this, this large sale leads to, uh, you know, exacerbated volatility in the, own, uh, in, the, in the initial fund that is doing the fire sale. But in a market where portfolios are diversified and have overlaps but with each other, uh, this will lead to contagion. So here's a, 
another scenario where the diversification of portfolios can be good at the level of the individual investor, but if everybody is globally diversified across all asset classes, it means that the fire sale by one investor in one asset class may actually lead to contagion to other portfolio just because everybody holds a chunk of that. Uh, so uh, now how can these, these results be used in practice? So here is a model where I assume I, I know everything, F, you know, the lambda. So I claim that this can be used in many practical ways as an operational add-on to current, uh, current risk models to compute the impact of fire sales of one's own portfolio. So if I want to make a contingency plan on uh, how will I liquidate my portfolio in case I have a loss, okay? So I, I take a contingency plan for my own liquidation. Using this approach, I can compute something about my liquidation value, my impact on volatility in that scenario. For an institutional investor, this can be interesting. It can also be used as a way of designing stress scenarios or stress tests for the liquidation of large, por por large portfolios. And if you look at the spillover formulas, they can be uh, used as a tool to monitor for contagion effects from strategy crowding, knowing something about the crowding of per portfolio. So if you're a fund of funds, you have some idea of what the funds you're investing in hold. If you see that 50% of them are doing similar things, then this is an important f factor for your risk. It's not enough to look at uh, uh, factors that are, you know, the returns of the indices, you have to look at this as a risk factor and you have the information to build a model where you have strategy crowding embedded into it. And the fourth application that I'm, I might show with some graphs is the forensic analysis of market crisis. All the examples I showed, it's plot, I mean, what, 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 the, what, what the market participants say is that, oh, these events are associated to somebody selling a large in a position, but this is just a qualitative, you know, thing. But what you can do is use this model to go back and lo look at that data and perform a precise forensic analysis, econometrically speaking, uh, based on time series of asset prices. For example, you can look at the inverse problem of recovering the portfolio which started the mess in the quant crash event uh, and so on. And this can be done in a precise way that I cannot describe here due to lack of time. But it's, it's, the, it's the econometric, uh, um, um, it's the, econometric application of this method. Okay, so let me uh, skip to this uh, example and finish with it. So for example, if we apply this to the August 2007 quant crash, what, what, what you can do in the model is that, well, the model tells you if I know the portfolio being liquidated and some information on market depth, I can compute all these effects. Now, uh, on the other way around, if I observe that some, something strange is going on in the market, and I hear that somebody is liquidating a large, large position, can I reverse en engineer and recover some information about the positions being liquidated? So it turns out that yes, the identification problem is well posed. So you cannot identify the portfolio, because the only thing that pops up in the in equations is portfolio times the speed at which you liquidate. So the only thing that you can identify is the volume generated by that guy during liquidation. So we cannot say if he's liquidating the whole portfolio or chunk of the portfolio, of course. But that you can identify, it turn, turns out. And if you do it, for example, for the August 2007 quant crash, this is the portfolio that we come up with. So this is a very non-informative graph, but basically it shows on the x-axis, it's uh, all the stocks in the S&P 500, uh, and on the vertical axis, it's the, it's the positions recovered by our estimation procedure. So what we say is that if you assume that uh, the volatilities and correlations during that week were exactly the same as the previous weeks, no change, but somebody was liquidating this particular portfolio during that week, then you get exactly the, 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 the uh, strange patterns that occurred during that week, namely that some funds were losing very large amounts of money while, while the indices were totally flat. The x axis is just labels of stocks, so Are one to 500. Yeah, yeah. So, so the only thing you can see is this is not a very good graph, but the only thing you see is that it's a long short portfolio, fairly well balanced long short portfolio, okay? And what's more interesting is, is this. Is this. So you saw that the spillover effect is governed by this 
scalar product between the two vectors, okay? So uh, the, the liquidation of alpha will spill over to the portfolio mu if this, uh, this scalar product is large. Um, so what you see is that uh, if you compute the scalar product for between this recovered portfolio and the index, so in this case it's, it's the S&P 500 index, what you get is this number, okay? And this corresponds to angle, which is very close to <laughs> pi over two in between the two vectors. So it means that uh, even if you don't know that it's a long short equity architectural fund, you just run the model blindly and you just estimate this from, from the return. So you don't need to know anything except the returns observed during that week. And you need to estimate the market, uh, uh, th 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 the depth on each stock from the previous data. So here we assume that depth and the covariance structure is exactly same as the previous weeks. There is no anomaly. Well, what you get is an implied portfolio which is actually orthogonal but to the index. So this gives you an idea of what, what was being liquidated during that week. Okay, so let me stop here and, and finish with this uh, last slide. So I think the global uh, thing that I wanted to say is that one cannot ask too much from a purely statistical approach to risk. No amount of statistical sophistication, I think, can quantify the impact of these liquidity events uh, that we discussed in the examples, uh, only based on past prices and returns. So we need to do something more than just statistics. We need to incorporate some mechanisms for liquidity feedback and these things. And my arg argument is just to say that this is not really difficult. It's not very difficult. You can just add on a simple term of price impact. And if you do that, even with a linear price impact that is apparently not very sophisticated according to Don, even that is enough to show that something non-trivial is going on and all these black swans, they, they become white. So it's okay. And um, if you do it, on the other hand, it leads you to naturally distinguish liquidation value from market value. It says, oh, pay attention, these are not the same thing at all. And you can compute the difference. It's not just uh, you know, saying that they're different, you can com compute the difference. And it shows you that the difference, to compute the difference, you need to look at size of the positions in your portfolio, you need to look at market depth, and you need to look at strategy crowding. So if you want to build uh, a model which takes into account this important source of risk, I think, if you're fund of funds, for instance, you need to incorporate these three ingredients in your model. There's no way that you can compute such things without having size in your model. So if you only look at the returns, you miss this thing. And once you incorporate this, then all the eight examples with spikes going up and down, or the, uh, these will not be anomalous when there's things that are naturally occurring in your model. They're endogenous events which are, are not unusual under the, the assumptions of the model. So let me stop here. Hello, yes. So before we start the question, many hands up. So we're going to have lunch sooner or later, so we should put a stop at a certain time. Okay. Thank you, Rama. It's a very amazing uh, talk. Uh, I, I'd make to use the same comment you made yesterday to Pete Kyle. That is, <laughs> uh, you find correlations of the order of 60 uh, percent. Uh, the reality is more like 80 to 90. And if I look at correlation as ratio between the systemic risk, the systematic risk, and the and the the, the specific risk, uh, it's also uh, huge. Uh, maybe uh, if you want to go one step further, I was thinking of what is called the ATM effects uh, in hedge funds, uh, when there was precisely a, a big. Uh, massive sale and a lot of the most illiquid hedge fund raised gates and the most liquid ones had to address the demand for liquidity so even those who were the most liquid the most respectful of investors and those who didn't lose money actually had to sell more than those uh, who did uh, trigger the demand for funds so the, the, the redemption of money. Uh, so in fact, uh, you even have a, a, a kind of spillover effect uh, towards uh, 
uh, funds that are labeled the same because they were just you know in the class of hedge funds like in the, the also among stocks among asset classes uh, you may have so this type of contagion effect simply because they are labeled the same investors decide to deleverage yeah, yeah. and then uh, and so, yeah, the, okay, the, so uh, and wait, wait wait and then the second effect is precisely they go towards the most liquid assets and the most liquid assets are also those who when they become a liquid the price impact is a, is the most sudden that the break in correlation now uh, in your function f you know is a, is a where your function has the biggest break in its slope and so when a when a liquid asset becomes a liquid it's much more devastating than when it is already known to be yeah, liquid I mean, uh, here okay so you're, you're saying that additionally to this, there may be dry up of li liquidity due to th these fire sales. Well, this will exacerbate, this will amplify this phenomena. But what I'm trying to show you is that even with, without that, even by assuming constant liquidity, so assuming that the mar market debt is constant all along, which is not very realistic probably, you already have this amplification effect. If you add on top of that, the fact that liquidity is changing, but this is very hard to, to you know, incorporate in the model. How is it changing? What does it depend on? Then you will have more amplification. Also, I mean, so here, this is just, just think of this as a proof of concept. Constant volatility, constant correlation, constant liquidity, you already get these effects. If you add Garch and, uh, you know, what, uh, the liquidity drying up, then, uh, yeah. 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 So, so uh, your your paper is very similar to uh, my paper, "Contagion is a Wealth Effect," with a JF paper with Wei Shang about ten years ago. Um, we have a lot of these features in there, but we also have optimizing investors uh, who have log utility and, and implement optimal consumption and portfolio rules. Um, and what we find that's um, kind of amp uh, maybe. Uh, similar to what you find, but, but maybe slightly different, is that if you think of the leveraged investors as being hedge funds, then mo most of the time they're actually increasing the amount of liquidity in the market by doing uh, convergence trades, by buying things that go down, you know, and, and, and selling things uh, that go up. But in times of crisis, when they're deleveraging, they're consuming liquidity as, 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 as they are in your model, amplifying volatility and amplifying correlation. Um, what, one thing that we find I think that's different is that, that the two extreme regimes might be different. We have one extreme regime where the, the hedge funds, let's say, don't exist. And then the market's actually kind of stable, but, but sharp ratios are very high. You know, there's like an opportunity for them to enter. And then we have another extreme regime where the hedge funds have huge amounts of wealth, and then everything is well arbitraged, and sharp ratios are very low, but, uh, but everything's very stable. Stable. stable over there. And then in the middle uh, is where you get the instability. And, and in the middle, it's where the, the hedge funds have a, a, a significant amount of wealth, but they haven't arbitraged everything away, and, the, and they, they're not so small that they're not having an effect. Well, but, so, but how do you distinguish hedge funds from other funds? So here, oh, I, we, just call, we just call them leverage investors. So in the paper, we leverage. call them financial intermediaries. But you can call them banks or hedge funds or whatever you want. And we have some exogenous liquidity that is provided by some other investors we think of as a sort of Warren Buffett type investors that will be value traders, but they don't have to be value traders, so they could, could be kind of ad hoc as, as in your, your last example there. But we have a, it's very similar to the continuous time version of what you got at the end where um, uh, we have um, uh, kind of the partial differential equations to describe the optimal behavior by a log utility investor, which is myopic and based on means and variances. And, the volatility is kind of perfectly correlated with the depth so that uh, you, you can kind of uh, do the risk management in the way you describe, and we advocate that in our paper. Um, I want to make one suggestion, uh, and that is in your, in, which is also something we don't have in our paper because we wrote it before uh, the quant crisis of 2007, we were thinking of the LTCM crisis. You've got your S&P 500 stocks kind of lined up. I would suggest lining them up by, by size and lining them up by value uh, and, and maybe even lining them up by momentum and I'm almost certain that what you'll see is rather than this random pattern that you showed us, which might be based on lining them up by ticker symbol or something, I, I, I'm guessing you'll see a, a, a pattern that shows that these were kind of uh, Fama French type factors that were being liquidated, uh, oh, yeah, as, okay. as, as in Kent Daniels' paper on the same I don't topic. know. I mean, I've, I've looked at it. You oh, you don't think so? Okay. If you're in that business, I know what it is. And, you know, those kind of funds are making long short bets on stocks and similar sectors 
So if you're long Apple, you're almost certainly short IBM. IBM. And so you, that's the way to pair them up. And then you'll, you should see exactly, basically, because everybody's hedging out all the common factors and you're betting on stocks. You know, the, the algorithm is to make things as independent as possible by hedging out the market, hedging out the industry, hedging out oil, hedging out interest rates. So you say that if we group them by sector, we still see the long short You'll, you'll see picture. a very strong long short alternation okay. and you should see okay. it that they're neutral by sector as well as by market and so on. So, but I wanted to make a different comment. Yeah? Yes, yes, that's yeah, true. But, but Andy's, Andy's just taking the very, very basic Statarb strategy. Nobody actually trades that strategy. The strategy they trade is like the one I said. But, okay, well, we, we should probably, but I just want to make another comment, which is that, um, did you look, I mean, in, in our paper with Stefan Turner and John Genicopoulos, we looked at a single asset, but we looked at um, the effect of levered margin calls, and what we saw is, is that um, you get um, clustered volatility and heavy tails. So did you look at, at the, I mean, you're, you're seeing the heavy yeah, tails yeah. and the volatility. Did you look at, at, to see whether you're getting the volatility being clustered? Yes, yes. So, yeah, so you do get you that see, too, right? Yes, yeah, so you, what you see is, is everything is in this formula here. So what you see is state-dependent correlations of volatility. So the special case of I equal J where we get the volatility. And this will be clustered because the dependence of the volatility in, uh, is on the fund value. So fund value is very correlated in time. It's a, it's a diffusion. So then you get clustering of volatility just because the, the variable part is slowly evolving. So Same effect that, we yeah. saw. And you also see a negative drift in the price. This I didn't say, but the price is pushed down, and that's where you assume concavity. So the second derivative of the deleveraging schedule is in the drift. So it means that if you're concave, if you liquidate faster when you lose more, which is not a very, very wild assumption, then you get a negative drift. So prices are pushed down. That's a price effect. But this is fairly well known. It's not surprising. Okay, going back uh, at the beginning of your talk, you were discussing about macro prudential regulation and, ma and uh, micro prudential regulation, and you were pointing to the contradictions of the two approaches. Actually, by looking at your model, now I have in mind banks, investment banks. By looking at your model, you seem to show us um, a, a path, a way, to solve this contradiction. As let's imagine we are a bank, we run your model, assuming that there is a large agent that has the very same strategies as we do. And then we run the model. Yeah. And we could imagine the regulator simply giving us the depth of the market positions of the strategies of this big agent based on the knowledge of the full banking system. Yeah, yeah, so, so I mean, you're exactly right. What I'm saying is that if the re regulator imposes uh, capital requirements on each bank based on the bank's standalone risk, so you compute the, the volatility of the bank's portfolio with historical da data, this will push them to diversify uh, and increase the overlaps with other banks. And this picture shows that this increases the, the potential for spillover. But if the regulator will impose a criterion on risk, which is based on not only the holdings, but uh, something which takes into account strategy crowding, it says, for example, oh, if you run in this strategy, it's a diversified portfolio, but you know everybody else is running that portfolio. So you have to have more capital requirements because of this. So something that penalizes a, uh, a a portfolio which is more exposed to strategic crowding, such a, such a penalty will, will uh, act as an incentive for uh, the banks to move away from crowding scenarios, and this will, will decrease systemic risk. But that means that the, that's something that only the regulator can do, or a fund of funds, for example. A fund of funds can do it this way. It says, I will not invest in uh, these funds because although they have a great sharp ratio, they're all doing the same thing. So if I invest in that, then one of them goes down, everybody goes down. So fund of funds, if they think like that, they have an incentive to you know, not allocate too much in some 
particular strategy, so they decreased the, the volume invested in that strategy, so this will bring down sy systemic risk because the, they, they decrease the size and so they, they decrease the crowding. So as soon as you put in a crowding factor, which is for me it's just a, some market cap for strategy types, then you avoid that caveat. But you need to have some information on holdings or crowding. And so the individual fund will not have that. Fund of fund will have that or can ask for that. Or they should have that, let's say. Yeah, so um, my question is, if you have in mind the paper of Adrian and Shin, where you know, this leveraging up and leveraging down is going also in the other direction. So you know, clearly, if you have a capital requirement, it's imposing to you to reduce you know, your position. But when things are going well, you are leveraging up. So if you're applying your rule on the other side, what are you generating? Bubbles? And then you know, which kind of correlation and volatility are we observing? Yeah. So uh, this effect is very asymmetric, because leveraging down uh, in these scenarios occurs uh, under a constraint which imposes that you do it pretty quickly. Leveraging up is, you know, you don't have a concept to do it very quickly. You can leverage up gradually over time. And this is what you see. I mean, the bubbles don't develop, they, the bubbles develop very slowly over time, over years or months. But when they burst, they burst over a very short period. There is a very big asymmetry between going up and going down. So uh, there is an effect. Your framework, you're not generating bubbles. Well, you could look at that in the, in, in the, in the other direction, but uh, then you have to say something about portfolios evolving over this period. If you're looking at a six-month horizon, well, portfolios are not static over that horizon. So how do they develop? You need more assumptions. You need something like you know what what Pete was doing with Wei Xiang. You need to have more structure in the model to say what do investors do on the upside, downside. Here we don't have that. We this is really very close to what a risk manager does in daily life. So they have a portfolio. Uh, they, they want to compute some risk. They're not computing risk over one year. It's over a short horizon, which is a week, or you know, some liquidation horizon, which is typically week or month at most. So over that horizon, you can say, okay, this is my portfolio. It is relatively static over this horizon, and I want to liquidate it. What, what's going to happen? The bubble, it's a macro thing. You need to see what's going on over one year. You, you can't really assume portfolios are static over that year, so it will be more... You see, when you want to liquidate a given position, uh, it's easier because you, you know what you're going to sell. If you want to leverage your portfolio, there are infinitely many ways to leverage it. In a single asset model, there's only one way to buy. In a portfolio model like this one, there are many ways to leverage it. How do you leverage your portfolio? How do you allocate your new capital? So you need, there you need the preferences. You need something about portfolio choice. And we will uh, recommend.